And uh, we are going through 1 Corinthians, and we are in chapter 7. If you have a Bible, you want to open to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 25 through verse 40, as we look at feeling the pressure to marry or not to marry. Uh, this chapter, the whole chapter, these 40 verses, have been talking about really feeling relational pressure. Because you have to understand, Paul the Apostle, he comes into Corinth, this pagan city that is just entrenched in its sexual immorality and all kinds of stuff. And he shares the hope that's in Jesus, that there is a Savior that conquered the power of sin and the power of death. And that through dying on the cross for our sins and shedding his blood on that brutal cross, ultimately becoming the substitute for your sins and my sins and then rising from the dead, that we serve a living Christ. And it took a supernatural work of God through his son Jesus Christ and the spirit of God for Paul the Apostle to establish a church in the midst of what was the Mediterranean Las Vegas, if you will, just uh, a, the, the sin city of all the Mediterranean. If you wanted to insult someone, you called them a Corinthian, which meant they were a drunk and a sexual pervert. And so when you look at all that they had to grow in and understand, the pressure in this chapter is, should we marry? Because how, what, how do we govern our uh, sexual desire? Because we are sexual beings. And so he talked about um, getting married or if you can, remaining single as a Christian. And so we talked about those things. Then he talked to Christians that were feeling the pressure. They, some were in bad marriages and getting divorces and how should all of that unfold. And then there were also those who were married to unbelievers, uh, a, a Christian woman married to a non-Christian man and vice versa. And all those different things, they create pressure. The Christian life, the Lord never told you and I that this Christian life was gonna be a cakewalk, that it was gonna be easy. He just promised to be with us through the process. And so he's never going to leave us or forsake us through all these ups and downs. And so now we come to this section that these single people actually want some more insight. Now, what do you mean it might be good if we stayed single? Or what are the uh, advantages of being married? And what are the challenges, if you will, of being single? And so as we unfold this, there are five thoughts in these verses from verse 25 through verse 40 as we look at feeling the pressure to marry or not to marry that Paul the Apostle wants to share with us. And he puts these bookends on it, if you will, in verse 25 and verse 40. He has no prior revelation from the written word, but as the Holy Spirit has given him judgment and the Spirit of God is inspiring him, this is an inspired scripture and inspired advice because you see they ask some questions but we don't have the letter with the questions so as we pick it up in verse 25 through verse 28 we see our first thought the pressure of distressing times it says now in verse 25 now concerning virgins I have no commandment from the Lord yet I give judgment as one whom the Lord in his mercy has made trustworthy I suppose, therefore, that this is good because of the present distress, that it is good for a man to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be loosed. Are you loosed from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But even if you do, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. Nevertheless, such will have trouble in the flesh, but I would spare you. They had asked him a question about virgins. Now, this appears to, the, the best thing for you and I to think about is those who are single. Obviously, when they talked about virginity, especially from a Jewish background in which Paul the Apostle went and preached at synagogues first, there was a very strong morality surrounding sexual things for the Jewish people. And uh, so when someone's single, hey, that's just taken for granted as a single person that they're a virgin. Not so in our culture that is very much like the Corinthian culture, very sexual immoral, very sexually promiscuous. A very, uh, our whole culture is sexually confused with its sexual orientation, whether it's the, the confusion of homosexuality and lesbianism or now transgender and all the different things. It's simply because we who are created 
in God's image do not know what God had intended until we come to a, a redemption and a born again state to discover what God has for us. Uh, as I've shared with you guys, I was so lost head deep in sin and sexual immorality and drunkenness and drugs and violence and all kinds of stuff, but it wasn't until Jesus broke into my world that I actually started seeking God. God, what do you want for relationships? like these people writing letters. Now, it would have been great when I first got saved to be able to write a letter to Paul the Apostle and get some good instruction. That would have been pretty radical. Hey, Paul, help me out. I'm really super confused. And so he says, now concerning virgins, I have no commandment from the Lord, yet I give judgment as one whom the Lord in his mercy has made trustworthy. Paul's now going to give some Holy Spirit inspired advice. And he says in verse 26, I suppose therefore that it, this is good because of the present distress that it is good for a man to remain in he, as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Don't seek to be loosed. Are you loosed from a wife or divorce? Don't seek a wife. Now he talks about present distress. Now, the thing is, is that commentators are not sure what he means by that. If there was a time in Corinth at this time where they were really suffering persecution, Paul the Apostle himself almost took a beating, but God supernaturally intervened when he was there in Corinth. You can read about it in Acts chapter 18. And so maybe the Christians were really going through a time of persecution. And so number one, he says, your current circumstances may make you take pause so that you don't launch into a relationship. Because just think about it, here in Idaho Falls, if persecution, I mean physical attack, begin to break out in our community, that if you're a Christian, you're going to lose your possessions, you're going to get beat up going down the street, whatever it might be in which that distress takes place, it's probably not a good time to hook up and get married. You know what I mean? Why? Because if I'm going through a time of persecution, it is more amplified to be going through a time of distress or persecution or hardship if you're married because now you're seriously concerned for one another. Now, it's one thing for me, uh, and this is the thing he goes back and forth all the way through. Like if I'm going to experience persecution or I'm, I'm going to be, get beat up for my faith and, and even, heaven forbid, my life be taken, I'm like, okay, that's the cost of being a Christian. But as soon as you put into that dynamic but Tammy's going to experience that. All of a sudden, I'm turned upside down. Because it's one thing for me to own the persecution in my own life, but to feel like I'm in a place of being out of control to protect her, to keep her safe, to see that she was harmed in any way would just it would just blow my mind because it would be very, very difficult for me. Or think about it, even if you add on to it, what if your children are persecuted? What if your little six-year-old son, they're going to kill him unless you renounce your faith for Christ? Think about the pressure of that. And all of a sudden you think, hey, you know, it might be good to hold off on that engagement we were going to do because things are pretty intense right now. And you say, you know, that was 2,000 years ago. Don't you understand if you check things out and you can check it out in whether it's what ISIS is doing or what is happening, uh, has happened for really the last 20 years in the uh, south of Sudan, and the persecution that is happening there of Christian villages by the Muslim marauders that come in and just, they kill the men, they rape the women, and then they, they, they cause the uh, children sometimes to kill their own parents. There is persecution happening now in the world. And if you are living in the south of Sudan or you're hanging out in neighborhoods where ISIS is coming to town, you might want to think twice about getting hooked up and getting married. But he says, because of this present distress, he said, are you divorced? Then, you know, it's probably best for you just to continue in that singleness. You're divorced. Are you married? Don't be trying to work on getting rid of your wife or your husband or leaving them because just don't change that dynamic. Now, back in verse 17, chapter 7, verse 17, he said something that's a principle through this whole area. He says this, but as God has distributed to each one as the Lord has called each one, so let him walk and so I ordain in all the churches. What the Corinthians were struggling with is when I got saved... 
I was married to a non-Christian, so they were divorcing those people. They were getting out of this job. They were trying to maybe run away from their slave owner because there was an issue that Paul answers when it comes to slavery and different things. And all of a sudden, as soon as they got saved in an internal supernatural experience with the true and living God, they wanted to change all their outward circumstances. They wanted to change their address. They wanted to change their marital status. They wanted to change their occupation. And, And Paul's like, wait, 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 wait. What has happened to you is supernatural, this work of salvation. But God called you while you're this person's slave. God called you in this marriage. God called you while you're single. God called you living in that neighborhood. God called you, and where God called you, he called you for a purpose, and that is for you and I to be salt and light, where we work, our neighborhood, where we live, in the marriage, where we're we're involved. God didn't make a mistake. And I think that this is one of the most difficult things that people have to process is that when you emotionally begin to struggle in a relationship or a situation and you want out, you just begin to tell yourself, oh, God wants me out. That's not always the case. I tell guys that are struggling in their marriage, you know, if you spent as much time thinking about getting out of this marriage, if you spent that much time trying to make this great, you would have the best marriage in the church. You're just always in your mind trying to get out. You're trying to get out. You're trying to get out. You're trying to get out. What's your problem, man? God saved you for a purpose. He saved you to transform you. Now, in that process, he tells us in verse 28, he says, but even if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. Nevertheless, such will have trouble in the flesh, but I would spare you. There are two things that seem to be pointing to this trouble in the flesh that Paul's trying to spare the brothers and sisters from. And that is the distressing time compounded in the marital relationship is going to create trouble in the flesh. What does that mean? You're going to have a hard time getting along, right? Now, when it comes to one of the challenges of marriage is you're going to have trouble in the flesh. The day you say, I do, (laughs) there is part of you inside of you that says, I don't. Meaning, I do want to marry this person, but you say, I don't want to be selfless and loving them. And that's the key to marital bliss. If you want to have a marriage that is the closest thing to heaven on earth, begin to deny your self-centeredness, husbands and wives, and begin to love each other, and you're going to have the most blessed relationship you can possibly have. But you and I wake up some days not feeling very selfless. We're kind of like, what about me? How come, what about me? How come you're not doing anything for me? When have you done something for me lately, right? Right? You guys are looking at me like you don't even know what I'm talking about. I'm going to have your spouse get up here and testify a little bit in a moment. If you don't get a little more responsive in this. Now, one of the, ma- one of the challenges in marriage, it's not bad, it's just a challenge, is that to discover two individuals that lay down, because they love Jesus, filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, they lay down their life in supernatural selfless power. And the more you lay down your life and you give up your life, then you find life. Jesus said this, this is, this is the paradoxical miracle of the Christian life. And unless you own this and figure this out, you're going to be a frustrated person. Jesus said, if you will give up your life for my sake, then you'll find life. What is he saying? If you'll begin to live selflessly for my name and my glory and for my purposes, and you'll let go of your self-centered will and decisions, and you'll begin to give your life away to other people, you're going to discover this incredible paradox. Hey, I actually feel feel fulfilled. Fulfilled. I feel fulfilled in, in my relationship. Okay? And so he says, but if you seek to save your life, what is he saying? If you seek to have your way and get your, your will done, then you're going to lose your life. If you seek to live a self-centered life, you're going to lose life and you'll lose relationships and you'll lose marriages. Because as soon as I say, I want my rights or I demand and I want, all of a sudden, death comes. Death comes. It comes to that relationship. It comes to my soul. It comes to my mind. It comes to my thinking. It comes to the whole process. Because you see, as this person created in God's image, I have thoughts, I have emotions, and I have a will to make decisions. And my thoughts, as I'm thinking 
through life. And my emotions, my goal is to get my emotions lined up. And this is where people get confused. Uh, your, your emotions are, are like a spoiled brat. They never want to do the right thing. They're always running off the wrong way. Your emotions, right? I know God wants me to do this, but your emotions are like, no! And you're trying to get them lined up, right? So that your thoughts and your emotions and your will, the decision you're making, oftentimes, I tell people, I'm moving through life and I know what God says and I, know, I make the decision based upon what God says and based on those thoughts. And about 70% of the time, my thoughts, my emotions, and, and my will are all lined up. About 30% of the time, my emotions are all in the wrong spot. Why? Because my emotions are governed by my own selfishness. Because I have this fallen nature that doesn't like to get along. It doesn't like to play well. It wants its way. And so you're going to have trouble in the flesh, right? Just think about it. If you have two individuals and they're laying down their life selflessly and they're loving one another, even that 30% when the emotions are not lining up can be a bit of an emotional train wreck, right? In the marriage, right? And woe unto the couple when the husband and wife both have an extremely bad day. And you, you, you want, you know, your own, own deal. Well, we've got a long ways to go. What am I doing talking so this long? We've got, we got a long ways to go. So next he says the pressure that there's not enough time. Check it out starting in verse 29 through 31. But this I say, brethren, the time is short so that from now on, even those who have wives, check this out, should be as those they had none, as though they had none. And those who weep as though they did not weep, and those who rejoice as though they did not rejoice, those who buy as though they did not possess, and those who use this world as not mis misusing it, for the form of this world is passing away. Now he brings this back into a, 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 uh, an exhortation for all of us. This is for everybody. Verses 29 through 31 is for all of us. And that is, time is short. Now, why he encouraged people to hold off changing their marital status, either single or married, before was because it was a time of distress going on in the Corinthian um, region or whatever it might be. Just like when we're in an extreme uh, difficult circumstance, we're sending soldiers to war and people are coming to me and they're saying, hey, the soldiers, my, my fiance is leaving next week. Should We want to get married. I'd say, you know, do you want to do that before they go? And why don't you let them why don't you let him go to war and then come back and figure this thing out because it's a time of distress. Now he says, because time is short. Now it's short in two ways. Time is short, and he, he means, as Paul says this so often, is time is short. The Lord is coming again. The Lord is going to come, and so you and I should get our spiritual priorities in order. And as we get our spiritual priorities in order, because the Lord is coming, we want to be the most effective in our Christian life as we possibly can. And so since time is short, not only because the Lord is coming, as it says in Romans 13, 11, it says, and do this, knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. You see, every day that goes by, I'm one day closer to the Lord's return. He's coming again. And so I should live as a married man, as a single man. Doesn't matter. Married woman, single woman. We should be living in light of the Lord's return. And it's a motivation to walk with God. Just think about your life. If you think about the Lord's coming, you want to be fruitful. Anyway, I do. I want to be fruitful in my Christian life. But secondly, time is short because my life is short and your life is short. It tells us in Psalm 39, 5, Indeed, you have made my days as handbreadths and my age is as nothing before you. Certainly every man at his best state is but a vapor. Selah. He says, every man, every woman at our best state, we're just a vapor. We're here today, we're gone tomorrow. And the word Selah throughout the Psalms, it means it's a, it's a musical pause that you pause and think about it. Just, just think about how short your life is, right? I'm 50. It seems like life is just raised by. And and so life is short in the time that we have. The length of our days, Moses tells us in Psalm 90, verse 10, the days of our lives are 70 years, and if by reason of strength, they are 80 years. Yet their boast is only labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. Isn't that true? 70 to 80 years, that doesn't seem that old for those who are 70 
to 80 years of age. My dad's 77, my mom's 76. They don't seem that old to me. They seem like they're, I mean, they're both able-bodied and, and it doesn't seem that old. And yet that's the window, 70 to 80 years. And that's all the time that you have. And so what should we do with that time as far as priorities are concerned? He says, those who have wives should live as though they don't have wives. Now, we have to put that in context of all the other scripture. You always have to compare scripture with scripture. Meaning that Paul the Apostle is saying here, maybe because of the distressing time, time is short that they're in a window of time where their service to the Lord, and we don't know all the details because we didn't get the letter that had the questions in it. So it's kind of like Jeopardy where you get the, you get the answer without the question. And, and so he's saying, you know what? You, You should really be sold out in your love and service for the Lord. Even us married folks. And it might be that there's Uh, more energy and effort given in the service to the Lord than at other seasons in our life where it's it's been invested in our marriage. Now, obviously, you want to have a good marriage. So that means, number one, you need to have a good partner in which you can love and serve like this. I'm blessed with an amazing wife that we have went through seasons. I have uh, drugged my uh, wife hither and yon in service to God. And we have lived, uh, we went and joined a staff to where we lived in Sunday school rooms with, you know, tall, green, 70s shag carpet. And it was a Sunday school room. And I moved my wife into the Sunday school room. We lived at the church in a Sunday school room. Uh, we had to, uh, basically, there were 30 people that lived on this campus. And because the church was going through such a time of distress that there almost had to be this free labor and service. And so we, uh, I worked my brains out six days and five nights a week, and it was the most difficult time of our entire 29 years of marriage. And Tammy, for, the, for, the, for months, Tammy cried every single day because it was so hard. Because we had never had a time in our whole married life where things were just frayed and just pulled to the very extreme of being poured out for the Lord. And things were so tight, we, we began to, uh, uh, we Tammy had to stand in line with the homeless people to get bags of groceries. And, and we've never had that experience before. And we, I mean, we just, this, through this whole thing, it was a year and a half of such distress and, and such difficulty. And yet, by and large, the way that I, I labored, even when I had my one day off a week, I was so exhausted. All I wanted to do was sleep. I was just, I was just wiped out. And through that time, Tammy told me one day, she said, Honey, why don't you just continue and finish whatever Jesus has for you here? And I'm going to move back to Idaho and be with mom and dad. And when you're done, come get me. And the kids. And I said, honey, that's not going to work. I got to have you with me. She was like, yeah, but I never see you anyway because you're, all you're doing is serving the Lord. And so she, she was very supportive. It wasn't like she was saying, hey, I'm leaving you. I'm divorcing you. Well, she was saying she's kind of leaving me. But... Uh, I mean, in a healthy way, she's like, I'll be waiting for you, honey, as soon as you get done. You know, with this season of living in Sunday school rooms and, 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 and laboring like this. And there's been season in our life. And, and Tammy and I both, now when we look back and all that God produced inside of us, the love and the sacrifice and that season, we do it all over again in a heartbeat. It was one of the best boot camps we've ever had in our Christian life. It was awesome what we learned and how we grew and how we went to new depths that we did not know we had. We experienced, new, we, we experienced new depths of God's love, new width of God's love, new length of God's love, new heights of God's love, things that we would have never discovered because the doorway to discovery in the love and power of God is usually through sacrifice and hardship. And so we discovered that. Tam and I are best friends. We always are together. But there are seasons in our life. I think today, by and large, there's a lot of Christian couples that quote in the name of families first. And Jesus is first, you guys. Marriage is second. Okay? And, and until we live in a generation that I think almost the Christian, Christianity has become a little self-absorbed. And that, hey, we're living for eternity There are people lost and going to hell. There are people that need to be loved and experience the grace of God. And how is he going to do that? He's going to do it through our lives. And so there are seasons in which those things are a real challenge. He he says this to everybody. 
And there needs to be a balance, as we'll talk about just in a moment in a marriage, that you have to have a partner. The Bible talks about in uh, the book of Acts, Aquila and Priscilla. And here was a couple that they were just wired for ministry and service together. They just loved, and that's the way Tammy and I, we're just just wired for labor and love and service together. And it just makes us stronger in our walk with God. But sometimes you don't have a spouse that's there. So you have to be sensitive to that and not over overplay your hand. He, He says, those who weep as though they do not weep. Those who rejoice as though they did not rejoice. What's he saying? Hey, you know, some of us are going through our life just depressed and weeping all the time. And and once again, we should be living for Jesus in eternity. There are those who are rejoicing their way through life. <laughs> All they want is just, you know, lighthearted laughs. And yet there's, there's a kingdom to push forward in this uh, day and age in which we live. It says, those who buy as though they did not possess. Meaning that we don't sink our roots deep into this world. This world is temporary, you guys. The things of this life are temporary. They, they're not eternal. They can't satisfy. And he says in verse 31, those who use this world is not misusing it. Meaning you and I, we live in this world. I use Walmart. I use Winco. I use the gas station down the street. I use money. I use my debit card. I have things that I've invested. But in the thing, the, the thing is, is that we use this world, but this world is not our home. We're pilgrims. We're passing through. Heaven is our destination. That's where we're going, man. We're on our way to heaven. And so the things of this life, just hold on to them loosely. They can't satisfy like Jesus can satisfy. But what is he saying? There are those who are weeping and wasting their time. There are those who are frivolously, or that's probably the wrong word. There are those who are in an unusual way. They're just looking for the laughs and the kicks in life. And this generation is YOLO, man. You only live once. Let's just have fun. Yeah, but eternity's coming. So there's nothing wrong with with having fun and having joy and and having laughter in your life. But if you're always just living for a thrill and a laugh rather than the glory of God, then you need to reprioritize. He says, for the form of this world is passing away. This world is temporary and we're living for an eternal world. Now, he tells us that there's pressure because of distressing times. He tells us that there's pressure because we're running out of time. And then he tells us that there's um, the pressure of being married. And what is that pressure? The desire to please another. That's at the core of every marriage. I don't know about you husbands, but I love to see my wife smile. Whatever can put a big old fat smile on my wife's face, I'm all about. And my wife loves to put a smile on my face. And it's strange. I don't know. But the same things don't put a smile on each other's faces. So those are different. What's he say in verse 32? But I want you to be without care. He who is unmarried, notice this, the single person cares for the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he who is married cares about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. There is a difference between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman cares about the things of the Lord that she may be holy both in body and in spirit, but she who is married cares about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. And this I say for your own profit, not that I may put a leash on you, but for what is proper and that you may serve the Lord without distraction. He says in verse 32 and verse 35, he says, I want you to be without care. I want you to live without distraction. And he said, this is the difference. This is the challenges to the single life and the married life. If you're going to be single, you can serve the Lord with total uh, undistracted attention. Why? Because you don't have a husband or wife to invest in emotionally. So one of the challenges in marriage is that as the day that you say, I do, then there should be this desire in you. And Paul's not saying it's wrong to please your wife. He said, he puts it in terms, you care about the things of the world, how to please your wife. Well, that's, that's normal. You guys, it's normal to want to please a wife. It's normal to want to please a husband. And it oftentimes will affect this physical world, whether it's, you know, that new dining room table or uh, this dimension of your relationship. We're body, soul, and spirit. And so whatever that dimension is, Paul's not saying it's wrong. He's just saying that's the way it is. Married people now go through life not just pleasing themselves, but they have another person that they are connected to. The two have become one flesh that they now need to please. 
So I, I find out what pleases my wife and I love to please my wife. That's a blessing. That's why we've been married for 29 years. That's hopefully why we'll be married for another 29 years. Why? Because I love to put a smile on my wife's face and she loves to put a smile on my face. So that's a challenge to those that you are now intimately connected to another human being in such a way that your lives are so intertwined that nothing happens in my life without affecting hers and nothing happens in her life without affecting mine. And so we're connected. So if you're single, if you're single though, if I lived in that Sunday school room, bring it on, put me in the closet, I don't care. I can live anywhere, go anywhere spontaneously at the drop of a hat, I could travel, I could do this, I could do that. But as this married man, it's different. Oh, I feel the Lord leading me to go live in a Sunday school room. We didn't just show up. I'm like, hey, hon, what do you think about that? Want to pray about it? She was like, well, I got to see it first. <laughs> she wants to check it out. You know, we had to go to do the tour of the, the green shag carpet <laughs> uh, Sunday school room. She's like, yeah, this is not too scary. She's an Idaho girl. She's, she loves Jesus. She's, she's all in. But you see, I had to take her into consideration through that whole process. And then when we, the Lord's moving on my heart to uh, move to Pocatello and start at Calvary Chapel. Hey, hon, I feel like the Lord's wanting us to move to Pocatello and start this church. Said, what do you think about that? You want to pray about it? You want to be thinking about it? Yeah, okay. We start praying together. We start spying out the land, checking it out. She's all in. Why? Because she's amazing. Hey, honey, I feel like the Lord wants us to move to Idaho Falls and start a church in Idaho Falls. What do you think about that? What's Idaho Falls like? I said, I don't know. Let's go check it out. So all along, I have this other person that I have to consider now. Why? Because I want to put a smile on her face. Because she's the best, next to Jesus, my wife's the best thing that's ever happened to me in this life. Timmy's the only woman I've ever loved in my entire life. And when you think about how you're connected to one another, and I can't, I can't, I can't move through life without affecting her. And she can't move through life without affecting me. And so that's too much for some people in their singleness and their self-centeredness. Because you see, they say, you know what? <sighs> Forget all that marriage drama. I just want to love Jesus. Then praise the Lord. God bless you. Go for it. But don't ruin what you think you have going on by getting married and then not being considerate of the person you married. Because that's not going to work. This, this is the problem. When single people try to live like married people, that's wrong. Single people, they are shacked up. They're sleeping with each other. They're acting like they're married. They got all the benefits, but they're not married. That's just, that's just flat out wrong, the Bible says. But then there are married people that want to live like single people. They don't want to call. They don't want to let you know what time, you know, they're coming home for dinner. They, they're, they're, they're inconsiderate at every turn. And they're living like a single guy, a single woman. You're like, hey, man, we're, we're married now. You can't be living like that. You're living like you're single, but you're married. So Paul tells us. Now, I just have to give you a, a word of encouragement that Paul the Apostle was gifted to be single. He said that it was great to be single and serve the Lord, but there's nothing wrong with being married. All the apostles, I want you to know that all of Jesus' apostles, do you know that they're all married? as far as we know. Look what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 5. Do we have no right to take along, this is Paul speaking, a believing wife, or do also the, uh, as do also the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord, these are the half-brothers of Jesus, and Cephas, who is a, which is another name for Peter. And so it's really uh, a challenge to learn how to strengthen your walk with God, learn how to be skillful in your relationship with your spouse, and then be satisfied. Now, you need to be strong, skillful, and satisfied whether you're single or you're married. What are you? You single? Are you satisfied? Oh, I hate being single. Can't wait, can't wait, can't wait. Get married. Now, do you think that getting married is going to solve all your problems? Dude, wake up. Right? As I've shared with you guys many times, when you, when, 
single people, and I'll meet married people. And this is the thing that I think that the Lord is really speaking back in verse 17 when he says, however you've been called. It is this sense of delay that people, whether they're single or married, this is the delay inside of them. Oh, I'm really going to be able to serve God once I get married because I'll have now a, a direction to focus my sexual energy. Now I'll be, I'll be able to serve God. Now, serve God now. I know single people, I, as soon as I get out of this terrible marriage, I'm going to serve God. No, no, serve God now. I know there are, you know, as soon as I get a new job, I'm going to start giving to the Lord's work. No, you're not. You're not giving now. When I win the lottery, I'm going to give the church some money. Well, you're not giving now, dude. You're not. It is always this, it is always this thing in their mind like, when I... When, you know, when the kids get raised, we'll actually start making ourselves available to serving God. Yeah? Is that true? No, it's not true. You know what? You go through life totally deceiving yourself, saying, when X happens, I'll do Y. Let me just tell you straight up so somebody can speak some truth to your heart and your face. If you're not doing it now, you're not going to do it then. Why? Because you have a pattern. You have a habit. If you don't give now when you work at McDonald's, you won't give when you work at IBM. And if you don't love God and serve God as a single person, what makes you think that you're going to do it when you're married? Or vice versa, because you're in a bad marriage, as soon as you're out of that marriage, now you're going to serve God. What makes you think that? Start where you're at now. And then the fruit will follow. Start where you're at now and the fruit will follow. And so this reality that he gives to us is, is really important for us to kind of wrap our brain around. Now, <clears throat> he tells us also, the fourth thing is the pressure of the expectation of others. Now, verses 36 through 38 are very difficult to translate because this is the way it goes. And I'm just going to do the best I can and give you these two alternative uh, understandings of this passage. One is it's talking about a guy that's engaged to a girl and he's struggling with now the pressure of others, the pressure of his fiance, the pressure of his future in-laws, the pressure of his own family because Jewish weddings were very much uh, prearranged by the fathers. And so there's pressure from others. But some translations take it because it can be taken the opposite that actually now it is the father of a single daughter that now is hearing this advice maybe for the first time and he thinks to himself, well, if that's the case, you can serve God with less distractions and no bozo son-in-law. Oh, all right. Let's just, honey, because fathers were in charge with authority. Honey, you're, you're going to stay single the rest of your life. Paul the Apostle said it's a great life. You get to serve God. No distractions. woo -hoo! And you're going to stay here and make me brownies, the ones I like. <laughs> right? Okay. So look what he says in verse 36. But if any man thinks he is behaving improperly toward his virgin, let's look at it first in this context, this person that he's engaged to, okay, if she is past the flower of youth, I'm not even going to venture what that means. <laughs> and thus it must be, let him do what he wishes. He does not sin, let them marry. So if he thinks to himself, he feels the pressure. He's engaged to this girl. She's a virgin. She's been waiting for the day. And now he hears this message about serving God as a single guy, but he's engaged to this girl. It's not too, too late to break off the engagement and say, I'm just going to live a single life. But he has to take her into consideration. And he's thinking, well, she's getting older. And it's not right for me to string her along because she is getting past the flower of her youth. And, and uh, I mean, she's getting a little as the, no, don't even say it, Rick. Stop. Okay, I caught myself. You guys should be so proud of me. I didn't say it was just about what I almost said. So the reality is, is that the, the person that she's engaged to says, you know what, I'm going to set her free. I'm going to break off the engagement because I'm not going to be put under the pressure from others. Whatever God leads me to do, that's what I'm going to do. It's better early than later. Now, if that is the case, he says, but if you choose because she is getting older and you should follow through with your engagement, he says, if you marry, you don't sin. It's good. You're just going to have to understand how to please your wife. You're going to have some challenges that married people do. 
And then it says in verse 37, nevertheless, he who stands steadfast in his heart, having no necessity, but has power over his own will and has so determined in his heart that he will keep his virgin does well. So in this case, it says, oh, but another guy that has the, the power over his own will. He talked earlier in this chapter about the gift of self-control as a single person so that you don't have to... Um, you don't have to get married because you have self-control over your own sex drive. And there are some people that, you know, they just, you know, we're unique, all of us, and some people have stronger sex drives than others. And so if this person has power over his own will, and it says uh, he's determined in his heart that he will keep his virgin, he does well, Paul says. Meaning, okay, they're engaged, but he's, you know what, he's going to remain single for a while and, and whatever's going to happen with this. That's why in this context, then verse 38, so then he who gives her in marriage does well, but he who does not give her in marriage does better. And it seems to turn on this, this thought that maybe that's the father, future father-in-law that's involved in that dynamic. That, um, and, and you can look at it both ways. You can go through those three verses, interpreting it like a man that's engaged, to a fiance, and you can also look at it as a father that has a daughter that is betrothed, which was the terminology of their day, f to a young man. And he says, you, you do well as well if, if you don't get married. And I think that in our culture, there's a lot of pressure from our culture that single, in, in their day, it seemed really, um, Paul was really talking about the benefits of being single. In our day, if somebody's single, it's odd because the majority of people are married. And, and it shouldn't be so, especially even in a, a Christian uh, church atmosphere, because knowing what the Bible says, a single person, Paul says, is freer to spend more time serving the Lord. But can I share with you what I see in single people's lives? They are single. They have a lot of time. They are free. And they still just, they're Christians, but they just live for themselves. They don't, yeah, I mean, there's a handful of single people that I know that really serve the Lord with their time and energy. And most other single people, you see the whole context through this whole thing is that in your singleness, you can be more useful for God. But if you're single and you're not useful for God now, I mean, you're not even, you have the benefit of the singleness and you have the time and energy on your hands, but you're not making yourself available because for whatever motivation, there's not a spiritual motivation inside your soul to want to do that for God. That's really between you and Jesus. Just as there are married people that are saved and they're waiting for that, that next thing when they're gonna serve God, but they, they just usually don't. By nature, you and I are self-centered people that wanna do whatever we wanna do. But what we, you have to understand, you are free to do whatever you wanna do, but this is the thing. The more that you discover the joy of giving your life away in God's service, the quality of your life and the joy that you experience is greater. And the more you live a self-centered life, the more diminished the joy is in your life. Because Jesus said, if you give your life away for me, you're going to find life. Life's just good. It's better that way. So you have to decide. Maybe you're engaged to somebody right now. You're engaged to a man or you're engaged to a woman. And you've got some second thoughts about it. And those second thoughts you should evaluate because it's easier to get out now than five years into your marriage. So make that decision now. Pray through it. If you have a father and a mother involved in that process and maybe you feel pressure from them and hey, maybe, maybe you've got to have a conversation. Mom, dad, I, I just feel like God wants me to be single. And if they're Christians, and, and I think that that's a tough thing, a tough thing to process, but you see all of the truth of it in God's word. And lastly, to wrap it up, we see this fifth pressure and that's the pressure of uh, loneliness and security emotionally speaking, in verses 39 and 40 for older widows. A wife is bound by law as long as her husband lives, but if her husband dies, she is at liberty to be married to whom she wishes only in the Lord. Meaning if she does, her husband's passed away and she's going to remarry, that she, he needs to be a Christian man. According to my judgment, and I think I also have the Spirit of God. I think that's the under, uh, understatement of all Paul the Apostle's statements right there. I think I got the Spirit of God too. Yeah, I think so. He wrote half the New Testament. So he's, he's definitely tuned into God. But understand this. Here's an older woman. Her husband's passed away. And she could remarry. Paul says, yeah, you, you know, your husband's passed away. You're going to remarry. Um, but make sure you marry a Christian man. But he says, I, I think you'll be better off at this as an older widow than um, you would be in your, uh, 
in a marriage. There are two things as people get older that you see. They want emotional companionship to solve their loneliness. And for ladies specifically, they want a sense of security. And so to hand off this, you know, marriage would solve, if it's a good marriage, marriage would solve that sense of loneliness and companionship, emotionally speaking. And it also, if it's a good marriage, it would solve that, that sense of, of provision that a husband can bring to st stabilize that relationship. Now, many people don't need that. They don't, they don't have the need financially. They feel very secure. And some people are just independent. They don't really need that emotional security. And Paul the Apostle says, you know, you can marry if you want to, but sometimes when you're older, you get married, and I've seen this even in my own family dynamic, um, a grandfather uh, ends up with another woman and all of a sudden there's, it, it, people have, have to figure out how to have new relationships in that dynamic. And it's, uh, it's different, it, it, it's just different. And so you have to sort all that stuff out, but you're free in the Lord. I don't know what kind of pressure that you are under relationally. I don't know how salvation has broken into your world to um, where you're single, and maybe you've navigated through that process. Uh, I, you know, I was not a single Christian very long. I got saved at the age of 19. I was married at 21, but in all that time, I was, I was in love with Tam. And uh, so I really had no doubt that I just wanted to spend the rest of my life with this woman. And I absolutely love the, uh, everything that marriage brings. I love companionship. Tam's my best friend. I love every dimension of marriage. Uh, I love the dimension that I get to figure out what uh, puts a smile on my wife's face. I get to figure out what makes her tick. I get to figure out what makes uh, a marriage work. And for me, that's, I, I just look at it as an adventure. It's just a big discovery to figure this out. And you go through different um, phases and you have, you know, the kids and the kids grow up and move away and get married and go to school and do all, you have all these different phases that you go through. And, but for those who are single, I've talked to a lot of single people and prayed for a lot of single people. And can I just share with you, I mean, a good marriage, there is nothing closer to heaven on earth than a good marriage. And I get to taste that and experience that. But when marriage is bad, there is nothing closer to hell on earth than a bad marriage. And every marriage is going to have rough spots. Even though I'm head over heels in love with my wife, we have had rough spots. But just because we decided never to discuss divorce and we did contemplate murder multiple times because of the challenge that there, there is, what is the challenge? My will versus your will. My will versus your will. I want what I want. And where, when I can get, wrap my brain around dying to myself and then loving my wife, and when she can wrap her mind around dying to herself and loving me, it just has this cycle of blessing that just gets better and better. But when people dig their heels in and get self-centered, and then it just goes worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And to, you know, I've never had anybody, I've never had anybody that's come in for premarital counseling Oh, pastor, you know, we're so in love. <laughs> just want to just, just get married. Okay. And, and, and I've never had anybody at the end of that time, you know, we set the date, the time, when it's going to happen, all that stuff. And then they say, you know, we might as well save an appointment. Why don't you give us some counseling in about three years when we get divorced? Now, I've never had that conversation because that would be a, a kind of a crazy, insane experience, wouldn't it? What I mean by that is nobody that gets married plans on getting divorced. Nobody. They don't plan on it. They plan on, oh, we're going to live happily ever after. It's going to be awesome. It's like Disney. Right? You never plan on getting the divorce. How do you, how, how do you go from the gaga getting married? Oh, you're just so in love. Can't live without this person. How do you get to that point that I never want to see your face again? How do you get there? Just by being selfish daily for an extended period of time. And there you'll end up. Life's no longer good.
Because you see, when you're dating, oh, what do you want to do? You want to please each other. Ooh. When you're dating, you take them to a nice restaurant. I mean, you're never going to do it again, but you do it when you're dating. <laughs> right? Going to take you to a nice restaurant. Now you only take them to La Golden Arches. That's it, right? You used to open the door. Ooh, let me get that door for you. You're my little princess. <laughs> now you walk through. Don't let it hit you. <laughs> go in there. And, oh, let me pull this chair out for you. Here you go. Yeah, I'll pull it out. <laughs> there we go. Do one of those numbers. Right? You, you would stay awake. The reason that we can't handle the euphoria that through the dating process is because nobody would live. You stay up till three in the morning. You got to get up at six. I mean, it's, it's, it's insanity. It's total stupidity, you know. And you'll talk for hours, even until you're going to sleep, you know. My love, I just want to have you hear me in my last words. And you get home now. You've been married a couple of years. And all your wife can get out of you is, uh huh. <laughs> yep, mm hmm. Yep. Maybe a grunt every now and then. Can I have the remote? And what happened? What happened? You no longer care about pleasing each other. I want you to know that if your marriage is struggling, there is no mystery. It's not like, oh, we just can't figure this out. A third grader could figure it out. Just being selfish. So, those who are married have to figure that out. And those who are single, you know, maybe God's just called you to be single, to serve God. But if you're going to be sing single and have all this time on your hand, you might as well be useful for the kingdom of God, for his glory. Let's pray. Father, we just ask for your help. We ask for your blessing. We pray that you'd strengthen us and encourage us and build us up. Whatever situation we're in today, we offer ourselves to you. Lord, we just pray that you take our lives and use our lives and strengthen our lives for your glory. Pray that you would help us sort out and sort through our own thought life, our own emotions, our own decision processes. Lord, that you would help us sort out um, the love and the, the grace that you want to for, pour through our lives for your kingdom. Lord Jesus, we know you're coming soon. We are just excited about that. And if not, Lord, we're going to come and see you soon. And so, Lord, just bless and build up your people in Jesus' name. Amen.